Okay, so what polymorph is basically saying to you? They saying to you, you know the meaning of polymorphism. It's one of the Greek word, the meaning of that many forms. Right. So with the help of polymorphism, our launch of code is going to be optimized as well as the performance is going to be improved. And to achieve the polymorphism, we require the three concepts basically. Uh, first stage inheritance, second is method overriding, and third is casting. And I believe all I have covered for you. Any doubt in this three? No. Fine. So first I will show you a program what exactly polymorphism is in. Try to concentrate here and then after I will uh, I will try to cover the same example polymorphism how we can do that. Okay. Fine. So the polymorphism folder is not there. So let me create a new Java project. And I'm giving poly more kitchen. <clears throat> First of all, to achieve the following message, you have to create one class. I'm going to create one class here with the name of A class. This A class is having the two member actually. One is in the I equal to 10 and second is wild test method which is having the one SOP with the name of test hyphen A. That's all. In this A class we have only these two members int i and void test both are non-static so that because we are talking about inheritance then it should be non-static. Create one more class with the name of B and first of all, I'm going to extend this B class with the A class. Mm -hmm. In this B class also, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write the same int i, but the value I'm going to give 20. And same method, write test, but value I'm going to give is, I mean, SOP that is test of B. So do you know very well what exactly I did here? Yes. Same method in super class and same method in child class. What is the concept name? Overriding, method overriding. Method overriding. Now, I'm going to create one manager class. Hmm. And in this manager class, I'm going to create one method static void call method and the argument of this method I am going to give as a A class. We have discussed about the data types. So meaning is very clear. You have to remember whenever A class is having the argument as an integer, you are calling, you have to pass one integer number. But this time, in this class method, I have kept the argument as a, a class, which is a super class for B also. Mm -hmm. So whoever we call this call method, they have to pass one A class object. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, after getting the A class object, what exactly I'm going to do? I'm going to call here A1 dot test method. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now come to the main method. What I'm going to do, I want to call the call method. But before calling this call method, I need to create a, a class object because a call method is having the argument as a a class. So let's create first a class object. New a. And now I'm calling this call method and I'm passing this a1. That's what you are first concerned with that. How we can pass in any object to another method. Right, right. See here, very simple. I have created one object and then after I want to call this call method. That is the reason it might try to create call object, I mean A class object because it is expecting one that object from me. So in the memory, what will be? Once you are creating an object here, so this is 
this a1 is local to main method mm -hmm. so you can't use this a1 outside this okay. and this a1 is local to this call method so why creating an object do you know very well what happened in the memory you have created a1 then automatically all members of a class which is a non-static got overloaded i mean loaded into the memory so in the a class what we have actually we have a i value that is having the value as a 10 and one more non-static member is there that is okay. yes yes no yeah so i told you while creating an object of any class they're all non-static member is going to be loaded on that time only if it is a static that is going to be loaded by loading the class itself mm -hmm. so in the main method i have created a class object and what i am going to do i am passing this object to the call method so initially this a1 was not having any value this a1 from here it is going and it is giving the value to the this a1 so what exactly happened the value of this object is copied into this a1 correct right so in the memory it will be like this this a1 is of local to main method and this a1 is call method a1 so now a1 is initialized and now what you are doing here a1 dot test method very simple you are trying to call the a class test method and that test method is already loaded yeah. are you getting my point or not very simple yeah so now if i run this program automatically it will get the output a1 a test of a class as a output then see the output, straightforward, nothing is much more. Simply what I did, I have created an object of A class and this object is passing to this A1 and finally this is got in its life and it, it can call any member of that class because we have already passed the object. And in the memory structure will be like this way. Now, still there is no polymorphism, this is straightforward. Now see what I am going to do. I am going to create a B class object. If you have created the B class object, then what will be? Of course, B class member will be also loaded. Yes or no? Yeah. Whenever we are creating an object of any class that you know very well, their members is going to be loaded. So here, I B 20 is going to be loaded and test method of p class is going to be loaded yeah. oh, here is a very good trick try to understand this concept <clears throat> whenever you are creating a b class object and you are thinking okay, in the memory a class method is still there then you are completely wrong because i told you very clearly in the last class no method overriding concept Whenever you are creating child class object, then in the memory, the presence of only child class method will be there. And that's what the method overriding concept is saying. Since you know test method is common in A class also and the B class also. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking you have created the test method of, I mean B class object and test method of A class is still there, then it's not like that. This test method is going and overriding the test method of A class. Mm -hmm. I is still separate for A1 separate and B1 separate. Yeah. But in the memory currently, if you come to the 11, line number 11, then we have only one test method in the memory, that is the B class test method. Mm -hmm. Now, see what I'm going to do. I'm going to call the same call method, but this time I'm passing the B class object. It's supposed to give me error because argument is a A class, even though I'm passing the B class object, it is not giving me error. Why? What is the reason behind this? Because it is inheriting the A class, inheriting the A class. That's not a matter because you know auto upcasting concept I told you. Of course, the inheritance is there, but you have to see here auto upcasting. Any super class reference can hold the child class object. Right. Yes or no? Yes. Now see here what happened. Still you are calling the a1.test method. Right. 
But this time, the object you have passed is B class wala object. So, value of B class is going from here, especially the method. Mm -hmm. I told you, I is still separate for A1. It is available in the memory. Mm -hmm. But whenever you are passing the B class object, then the A class test method is overrided by B class test method. So this method now it will give you the output as a test of B, not a test of A. Can you see the output here? Yeah. And that is called polymorphism, Mr. Govan. Mm -hmm. What is polymorphism definition? Same code, but giving the different, different output. I didn't change anything into this method. Right, right. I'm simply passing the parameter from here and sometimes it is giving the A class object and sometimes it is giving the B class test method. So this is the main concept, this diagram I have created for you. Many people are having the confusion in method overriding itself what exactly happening. So method overriding you should be clear okay, whenever we are creating child class object then in the memory method cannot be duplicate there is never a chance if a class method is still there. Understood or not? Right, right, right. And this is happening completely at runtime. Whatever I did like this way, that is not happening at the loading time. It is happening at the time of runtime. That is the reason we used to say dynamic polymorphism. Right. People used to say there is two types of polymorphism. One is static and another one is dynamic. A static dynamics we are considering as a method overloading concept and dynamic polymorphism is nothing but whatever I have shown you currently. But I believe uh, method overloading is not a dynamic, I mean polymorphism. Polymorphism clear concept is this only. You have to create a common method. Now you can ask me why I didn't give in the B class here. If I give B class the child class cannot hold the super class object. Mm -hmm. It is not able to work. Down. So always keep the argument of super time. Yes or no? Yeah. One more interesting point I will tell you here. Where exactly downcasting is coming in picture? Yes or no? Yeah. Assume, assume one scenario. Currently we have a A class and B class only, then we can say, okay, fine, I can give the A class. So it can uh, access the A class object also and B class object also. But if you think from a generic way, if you're developing any project and if you're thinking I can give the A and B there, then it's not like that. There is a hundred class and different different types of class. People can people can pass any class object anytime. Then what will be? If I'm passing the C class object here, C class is in no way related to this A and B then what will be? It will give you compile time error. It will tell you the A and B is related to each other, but C class if you're trying to do, then it is no way related. Yes or no? Right. Then what we will do? Let's, let's develop on C class also. As you mean this C class also, I have given the wide test method. But this class is no way related to the a and B. It is a separate class. <coughs> Take it. It is not extending any class. Mm -hmm. But I want this method to work as a generic, not only for A and B. But currently I have given the argument as a, a class. So it will take either A or their child class. And of course we have A and B here. Right. But what if I want key, this can work for a, a, B, C, anything. Then what you need to do make their argument as a object type. What I did? Oh. I make the argument as a object, you know very well, object class is a super most class for every class in Java. Right. Yes or no? Right. Your voice is coming very slow. This topic is very advanced, Mr. Pogon. You need to concentrate a lot, then after you will make yourself very confident. Right, okay. my voice okay. is not clear? No, it's okay. Okay, okay. So this method, call method now having one argument as your object class. So let's give some proper name here, obj. This is just an argument. This obj is not having any value. Now object class is saying since I'm a super class for every class in Java, so anybody can create an object and they can pass to me. Yes or no? Right. That's what we can do with the super class. 
Even A, B, C, D, any class if you talk in Java, all class is a child of object class, so any class can pass the object. But you need to call a you need to call a a class method. But object class is a super class. Yes. If you call like this way, OBJ this, then you will still get error because object class will tell you that is not actually way to take your value. See here what I'm going to do. This object class is saying, of course, someone has called me and they have passed me the A class object. Mm -hmm. So this OBJ is saying that indeed I am holding the A class object, but the way you have to take me should be different. Now here you will see where exactly downcasting is coming in picture. We know very well this is a super class and the value which is coming from main method is a, a class object. So it is just a container, but internally value is of a class object. Right. So what I need to do, I will take to this OBJ to please return my object like this way. You have my object inside your body. So I'm saying to the OBJ, whatever object my caller has sent to you, that is a A class object, please try to give my A1 here. But object class is saying, boss, I am your super class. Mm -hmm. The way to take your value is not this way. What I need to do? Right, uh, I have to do like this, down casting. Uh, I'm saying to this OBJ, keep, please give me value and OBJ is saying, Someone has given your value, but I will not give you directly. You have to first downcast me, then after I can give you a value. Are you getting my point or not? Yes, yes, yes. Now, if you run this program, you will see here test of age is still coming. If you are passing the B class object, you have to do the same thing B class like this way. If you are passing the C class object, you have to do like this way. So, what exactly I need to do here? There is a scenario many classes coming, then this approach is not good, but make sure that whenever you want your argument should be generic, any class can send the object, mm -hmm. then make sure that we need to give your object class as argument. Okay. If you are very sure you want that certain hierarchy is there, A, B, C, D, you want to uh, play around those classes only, then give the argument as a super class of that hierarchy, mm -hmm. so that will play a role inside that. Now here, if I pass B class object, again I have to change the logic here. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Again I have to write the... So, for that purpose, I can put one if block here. Yes. And I will check OBJ EJ instance of A class. If it is an instance of each one of the operator in Java which is checking, this object belongs to A class or not. So if it is saying true, then I will be downcasting into A class. Assume. This time you are passing the B class object. Then what I will do? I will take OBJ EJ instance of B class. Kya is bar object to I have B class ka hai? Mm -hmm. Agar B class ka hai, then what you need to do? Similar way, B, B1 equal to mm -hmm. B class ka hai ka, aap mera object dijiye, is bar meta object aap ke saath hai hai, and again I will call the B1 dot test method. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Right. Yeah. So first time, if you call this, then this if block will give true because you are passing the A class object, yes. and you are calling the down casting it, and you are calling the A class test method. Mm -hmm. Second time before passing the B class object, what will be? This time this condition will be false, this condition will be true. Mm -hmm. So next, next time your B class test method will be called and can you see here? Right. It's coming or not? So, so that is the concept of... Oh, one more interesting point you will see here. Whenever you are passing the B class object, why? Then B, the, both condition is going to be true. I told you during the casting itself. Every object is a instance of their class as well as their super class. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. If you remember the casting concept last class. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. See this. 
manager two were there i guess yes so in manager one i told you if you create a d class then d class is a instance this instance is of object class also a class also b class also c class also d class also mm. yes or no all are coming true 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 or not check it out right that is the reason here also whenever you are passing b class object the oh, this condition is also going to be true because a is a super class of b class and this condition is also going to be true that is the reason you are getting the two times aj b b test of b and test of b so this couple of programs will clarify your lots of doubt whatever you were expecting <laughs> you need to practice a lot but i am going to change the uh, one actual example on this first uh, my intention was to make you comfortable with the polymorphism concept mm -hmm. how it's working second intention was to show you where exactly down casting is coming picture mm -hmm. now i will give you the actual idea where exactly we can use polymorphism theek okay, hai one uses i given you but the same vehicle program last class i have developed for you know right that program i am going to convert into the polymorphism ठीक है प्रोबेबली दिस फोल्डर विल बी नॉट बिलोंग्स टू इनटू द कोर वन सो आई विल बी सेपरेटली मेनिंग विद दिस फोल्डर सो यू कैन वर्क ऑन दैट ठीक है नाउ सी द यूसेस ऑफ पॉलीमोथिज कम टू द इंटरफेस फोल्डर वंस अगेन वेयर आई हैव डेवलप्ड द प्रोग्राम फॉर पॉलीमोथिज एंड दिस वाज माय मैनेजर क्लास इन दिस मैनेजर क्लास यू हैव सीन I have created a two-wheeler class object, and then I have called the cost and speed method. Yes or no? Yeah. Again, I have created the four-wheeler class object, and again I have called the cost and speed method. Isn't it? Right. So if you have a three-wheeler, four-wheeler, I mean five-wheeler, six-wheeler, twelve-wheeler, mm -hmm. then how many times you have to call the method? Two times for each one. Let's say you have a five class, and five to the ten times you have to call the cost method, speed method, cost method, speed method. Right. This is not good advice, well. Now a bit idea will coming in your mind. Okay, how we can use the polymorphism here? Let's develop a separate class with the name of Manager One class. Just like Manager class here, what I'm going to do? I'm going to make one a static white. call method once again and i am going to give a argument here as a vehicle directly why vehicle because vehicle is a super interface for all the classes yes or no okay. yeah. do you remember the last class hierarchy or not right vehicle was the one interface which is going to extend it by two pillar and four pillar so what i did here in the manager class i make the argument as a vehicle now only one time i have to call v1 dot cost method v1 dot speed method correct right now simple things we have to do here you want the two wheeler then t1 equal to new two wheeler and call this call method by passing this t1 object of course it can accept because i have given a super type there right yes or no yeah no need to call the separately cost method every time that is my intention you want to call four wheeler four wheeler again you have to create a four wheeler class object only mm -hmm. four wheeler object and you have to call the same call method call method of one that's now we have seen <coughs> that's all now whenever you want to three wheeler five wheeler six wheeler only you have to create a object and pass to this call method 
whenever you are passing the two wheeler class object this v1 becomes the two wheeler class object this will call the two wheeler class method whenever you are passing the four wheeler class object this v1 becomes now four wheeler class object right. so you will get the same functionality whatever you have seen in the last class but here i have optimized the code and that is the actual use of your polymorphism casting and whatever concept interface yeah. mr pavan how you are feeling now <laughs> No, I think you have clarified all my doubts now. <laughs> Whatever the questions I had so far. Yes, sir. I always told you have patience in my class. So what I see, I'm not kind of people who directly I can jump like anything. I know what are the things we require for the upcoming topics. Right. So let me cover those first. Yeah. So yeah. of course, casting was required for that. That's the reason I covered casting for you. I told you down casting will be coming in picture. When I will give you example, mm -hmm. I'll give you the example. Mm -hmm. So always I used to tell to my students, "Ki just have a patience. Every doubt will be cleared, and you will get the actual uses of all this." And I, I okay, Mister. This is the most important topic in OOPs, I guess. <laughs> of course, it is. Extract of all. And now we have learned so far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So based upon this concept, now you can convert your all student vala, school vala example as well as RBA vala example into the polymorphism. Yes or no? Now I am only feeling that I have written the code like a small kid. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, uh, that's cool. Even though whatever I, I was expecting that time I didn't cover you polymorphism for you. So right, right. you did your good job. Uh, initially, I even in manager class also I did the same thing. You no, know, whatever you did. So that job is a step. And once the concept will be much clearer, I will show you the same class. How many times I will modify? Yes. You can do much much better than this. So slowly slowly concept will come, then I will utilize that. So now easily you can change your whole structure of your program and convert all this stuff into the polymorphism types and try to use the scanner class and then utilize the all concept. Okay? Yeah. Shall we proceed now? Yeah. So next topic is again a very very important probably. Many people is not going to show you the much things about that topic. That is, of course, object class. Mm -hmm. Object class is also, I believe, it's a very very important topic. And uh, I found in many institute they are not even discussing and talking about object class, and they are saying course is over. But as experience, I know very well what the real uses of object. Fine. So next topic, each object class. So far, what you know about object class? Only one thing you know. It is a super most class for every class in Java. Yes or no? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Are you there, Mister? Yes, sir. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I I can hear you. So, object class is super most class for every class in Java, which is available inside Java dot lang package itself. That's the reason you don't need to import any extra things. Right. The first point is it is a super most class for all class in Java. This is the second point you must have to remember. Now, in object class, we have a certain method. So there are. There are totally eleven methods mm -hmm. inside this. You we'll see one by one what are those methods? First is two string method. Second is equals method. Third is hash code method. 
who teach weight method modify modify all get class clone finalize now weight method is overloaded three times overloaded you know Mm -hmm. Inside object class, we have a three weight method. One is no argument, another is two argument, another is three argument. That's the reason I told you it's an eleven method. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. These are the methods inside object class. Two string equals as code weight notify notify all get class clone and finalize. These all methods are so much important. We need to see one by one all these methods. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Now, as we know, whenever we are going to create any class object, then what is happening? All of their non-static member is going to be loaded into the memory, and some allocation is happening automatically in the memory by the GPU side. Right. Yes or no? Yeah. So let's say you have seen int i is there, then we have always used the something like this int i. is there like this way then if you want to call this i then how we are writing a1 dot i and we were getting the output as a 90 isn't it yes. very clear yeah have you ever tried to print object itself like this way? without dot i yeah. i just want to print the object itself yeah. you never tried right Can you guess what without some address I guess? What address, right? Yes. Exactly. So it will give you memory address in the format of hexadecimal with the followed by class name. So class name at the rate of memory address in hexadecimal format. Oh. Okay. Yes or no? Yes. So whenever you are trying to print the object, I told you very clearly. Okay, whenever you are creating an object, automatically one new allocation is happening, and same thing happens here also. So let's assume so I am going to create one more object. As I told you, n number of times you are creating an object, then what is happening? N number of times your new allocation is happening. So this time you will get a different output, different memory address. Yes or no? Yes. So meaning is very clear. Key one time there is a separate memory location and second time also there is a separate memory location. Yeah. I also told you the copy constructor kinds of stuff where the location is same but we are having the two difference. So in this case A2 and A3 is having the same location. Yes or no? Right. So I am expecting the output of this program the last two should be same because I am doing the copy constructor. And then of course you can see here there is the same output for the A2 and A3. Okay. So it's clear now. Yeah. Whenever we are copying any object into another reference, then what is happening in the memory allocation is one only reference is going to be created in new. New reference. Okay. This is a normal thing. Probably many people are knowing. But when I learned this concept, I was really shocked. Okay, how this is giving the memory address. Mm -hmm. Simply printing the object output is always coming from certain variable or certain method. How object itself is going to give the output to me? That is my main concern. Right. Without calling any method, without calling any variable, how it is able to give me the output? Then later I know that in internally you are thinking this is nothing here, and you are wrong. Every time there is a two-string method. 
Oh. Whether you are calling or not, if you are thinking directly object, then internally there is a two-string method in A1 also, A2 also, A3 also. You can run this program, there is no impact of output. Check it out. Still you are getting the same output, class name followed by the memory address. Okay. So now onwards, you have to be very clear whenever you are printing an object, make sure that, or whenever you are using an object to stand alone, mm -hmm. then internally there is a two-string method. And I don't think so it's required to tell you it from where this two string method is coming because we know very well every class super class is the object class and just now the first method of object class I told you that is a two string mm -hmm. method. Yes or no? Yeah. So due to inheritance concept this method is came to you also and you can easily call this two string method whether you are calling or not. Every time internally there is a two string method. Clear? No. No, no. So this is the concept which is dealing with this, uh, you know, twisting methods mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, you have some question? No, no. Now, I don't want to call, I mean, I don't want to get the memory address. So I just want to get the value of this object, that is I, even though I'm trying to print simply object. My intention is to get the I value that is 90 while printing the A1, A2, A3. I don't want to get the class name at the rate of memory address. The first approach is that you have to write A1.I. But I'm saying to the compiler, no, I don't want to write A1.I. I will not change these three lines. Only instead of getting memory address, I just want to get the value of this object. How we can do that? Let's say currently you don't have two string methods. So what is happening? It is calling from the object class that is your super class. Yeah. What I did, I have overrided the two string method inside my class also. We can easily do. Yeah. You can override the two string method inside my class because object class is a super class. Yeah. And in this super class, I mean in this two string method, what I'm going to return is plus i. Whenever, now we will call the twisting method. Now it will not go to the super class for the twisting method. Why? Because once any old class itself is having the same method, then the priority of your class method is higher than the your super class. So now it will call, still there is a twisting method because we didn't change this part. It is still calling the twisting method, but this time it will call your twisting method. What your twisting method is doing? It is returning the I value. Why I have did like this concatenation because the return type of this method is a string. So you can't directly return the i. It will give you compile time error. It will tell you the i is an integer and return type of this method is a string. So to pass this value, you must have to concat. And we can't change the return type because you know very well in the overriding concept, we need to follow the same signature whatever their super class is having. Yes or no? Yeah. So that is the simple logic I have applied here. I have concat this size with the string, empty string. Now if you run this program, then instead of getting the memory address, you will be getting the value of your object. So idea is very simple. Whenever you don't want to call separately I, separately J, you have did into your class, no? You have shown me with the student class there. You have a lots of attributes. Right. And what you need to do every time you have to write a1 dot something, a student dot roll number, a student dot name and all. So if you don't want to do that, then you can do a very simple things. Overwrite the two string method inside your class and try to return like this way. Like this way, you can also return i equal to like this way. Let's say I have a g also here. We have a g also. Just like your student class, you have a lots of attribute. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call separate, separate i, separate i, separate j. I just want to print object and I want to get the all value. Again, you have to write plus comma equal to plus j. Now see, if I'm simply printing the object, I'm getting the i and j value or not. I supposed to give j here. Check it out. Oh. So anybody want to print the all value of your object, then you must have to override the two string method. 
and this is very very important concept because I will show you from now on first many classes we have in object class. I mean Java that is overriding this two scheme method and that is the reason we will not get class name at the rate of hexadecimal number. If you talk about a string class, if you talk about wrapper class, if you talk about any classes of collection framework, all are going to override the two string method just like your class. That is the reason you have noticed or not. <coughs> If you created a string class object like this way, anyhow we have a separate topic a string, don't worry. Mm -hmm. But let's assume I have created a string class object like this way and I have given S1 equal to ABC. So my aspect is if I am printing the S1, it is also one of the object, right? It's supposed to give me the class name at the rate of hexadecimal number but you will get a ABC. So what is the meaning of this one? Internally here also there is a two string method but this two string method is not from object class just like your class just like how you have overrided the two string method a string class is also overrided that is the reason you are getting a value from this string class. Can you see here? Oh. If a string class is not overrided the two string method then definitely you will get a class name at the rate of hexadecimal in the string class case also. Yeah. So whenever you are printing an object and you are getting a value then make sure that that class is already overriding the two string method just like your class. And many times this concept is coming with young people are having lots of doubt what exactly two string method is doing. So many times you will find in Java lots of classes are there. They are already overriding the two string method just like you. So if you go to the string class Take mm -hmm. it out. I mean, the string dot class and take it out. There is a two string method or not? Actually, this method is not belongs to the string class. It is mainly from the object class. But whoever class wants to override, they can override because you know very well every class is having the super class in the object class. So check it out. This time you are calling the string class. It belongs to the string class or not? This is the Java like code, we can't understand how it's working. Whatever value we are passing, it is returning the same value that is this keyword. I told you very clearly. Yeah. Now, so forget about these things. But currently, you have to always remember whenever we are overriding the twisting method, it is giving the value of the object. Whenever we are not overriding the twisting method, it will give me the class name at the rate of hexadecimal. Yeah. And the very, very important point is whenever you are printing an object internally, there is a twisting call. Whether you are calling or not, Definitely there is a twisting method. Yeah, you were asking something. Come on. Yeah, I was just asking like how did you go to that class? Okay. And directly you want to go to there, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you are asking how I went there. Yeah. Okay. So what you need to do, you have to press the control button in your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. If you press control button and if you bring your cursor to the twisting, it will become one. Oh, okay. Link. Okay. Because I am holding the control button in my keyboard, that's what. If I didn't, it will be simply like this way. So if you click on this, then first time it will not go directly here. It will ask you to attach something. Mm -hmm. So what you will get basically, you will not directly reach to the object class. It will tell you attach source. So there is an external source link will come. So what you need to do, you have to click on external link and wherever your JDK is installed, under that JDK you will find one zip folder that I have shown you, you have to select this folder. So this is src.zip file you have to select, then after you will get this one. Oh. Okay? Mm. Not only that, if you want to see the documentation online, you can see that also. See, if you bring your cursor here, you are getting the all documentation here. Yes or no? Right. Can you see here? Yes, yes. Whatever a string class is having the documentation. If you want to know more is structure about this string class, there is one icon here. Open it as Doc Java. If you have an internet connection and if you click on this, it will open the complete hierarchy of that Java documentation in your Eclipse browser itself. Check it out here. It is a string class which is extending with the lang I mean object class inside the lang package or how many interface it is implementing. What are the methods? What are the constructors? Also are here. Okay. 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 So, 
So you are okay with the twisting, Mister? Yeah. I will ask you. If you forget this, then it will be very difficult for me to proceed yeah. further. No, so I mean, all this stuff. Really, you know, uh, the few days back, I was doing some uh, things on my own, and somewhere I got the code in Google where they were doing the same thing. You know, like you have done the string. Uh, they are like uh, returning the string like this by concatenating with the name and the value. So I just copied that code and pasted, and it worked. But I didn't know how. <laughs> what are they doing actually? How about now? Now you understood now? Oh, at least yeah. Now I know what, what was happening there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Sir, as I did it is equal, don't worry. Okay. We will be a master of Java now. Yeah. <laughs> <Hope> so. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the two string method that we have covered. Now second is equal method. Mm -hmm. A one is also the same. I suppose to discuss about the two string method. Okay. Now. Let's talk about the equals method. What is equals method? Before going to the equals method, I just want to show you equal to operator. We have one equal to operator also. This is called, I mean, relational operator. If you are writing a one or something like this, i equal to ninety, then single operator is known as Assignment operator. Right. So, what is the meaning here? I am giving the right hand side value to the left hand side variable. But if you write here double equal to, then what exactly you are trying to do here? Check. If you write equal to equal to, then you are comparing whether i is equal to ninety or not. Yes or no? Yes. So, this is called relational operator. So you know the basics of operator like we have a dot totally create operator, yes. increment decrement operator, assignment operator, conditional operator, logical operator, arithmetic operator. Yes, lots of operators are there. That is the bachcha wala. You can proceed accordingly. Now, so what I am doing here, I am just checking whether the B1 is equal to B2 or not. And so we are supposed to write B2. B1 and B2 is equal to or not in the sense memory perspective. Equal to operator is always checking from the memory perspective. So we know very well whenever we will use the new keyboard, automatically new allocation is going to be done, and that's what I did for the B1 also and B2 also. Yeah. So B1 and B2 both are in the memory having the separate location. So if you run this program, it will give you false and because both are not the same memory allocation. So if you run this, you will get a false. If both are same memory, both are having the same memory location, then you will get it true, and that's what you will get in the case of B2 and B3 because it's a copy constructor. Yes, I know. Right. In the memory, we have the same location for this. So this equal to operator is always checking the memory location. Can you see? And now you are getting true. Right. Now, same thing. Your equals method of object class is also doing. So I'm passing the b1 dot equals b2. Only the equal to operator I have replaced by the equals method. It is also just like the equal to operator. It is also doing the same job whatever your equal to operator is doing. So it will also give the false because b1 and b2 is having the different memory location. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you are interested, you can check the b2 dot equals and pass the b3. So this equals method is asking the one parameter that I will discuss right now. So whenever you want to call equals method, one object you have to, uh, by one object you have to call and another object you have to pass. So internally, the object class equals method will check whether both are same. If both are same, then it will give true. If both are not same. From a memory perspective, then it will give a false. false. Clear? Yeah. Now, I don't want to compare the memory location. I just want to check the value of the object. I want my comparison should be based upon value, and we know very well i is common for v1 also, v2 also, and v3 also. Are you getting my point? Yes. How I want comparison? I want the comparison 
based upon value. value. So again, we have to change the logic of the Smith and whatever Java people has did. So once again, I'm going to override the equals method. Once again, you will see the very clear picture of downcasting in this equals method. Check it out. This is the structure of your equals method. I told you very clearly, if anybody want to make your method as a generic, then you have to give argument as your object. Check it out. Java people also following the same or not. Because they are not knowing what time, what object users will call. That is the reason equals method is having the argument as a object type. Now, what is my intention? My intention is to compare the value, not the memory location. Yes or no? Yeah. Fine. So you know we reveal by which object you are calling, that is the current object of your class and that is nothing but your this dot i. So if you write this dot i, then that is nothing but your b1 dot i. b2 is directly coming and initializing the obj. Yes or no? Yeah. Because here, whatever value you are passing from here, so you can't directly write like this way, b b1 equal to obj. We can't write, just now I told you, it is never possible. What object class will tell you? First, downcast me. Doesn't matter, someone has passed your object, but you have to pass this. Now, one object is this dot i by which you are calling and second object we got by the obj, that is the b2. Now, what I need to do? <clears throat> I have to check this, this dot i as well as the b1 dot i. Of course, we know here, again, equal to operator will check the left hand side value is equal to right hand side value or not. Yes or no? Yeah. So this time you are not comparing with the memory location. What you did, you have taken the value of this B1 and this B2. And finally, you are going to compare the value, not the memory location. So same, these two will be giving you the output now as a true true. Because at the end, B1 and B2 is having the same value. B2 and B3 is also having the same value. So once you have overrided, your comparison will be based upon value, not based upon memory location. But make sure that equal to operator is still taking the memory location. We didn't change any things under equal to operator. We have changed the logic of equals method. So instead of initially you were getting the false true, but now if you run this, you will get true true. Can you see here? Yeah. Hello? Yes, Nikhil. So this is the overriding of equals method. Mm -hmm. If you don't override, it will always check the memory location just like the equal to operator. That's why you are getting the false and true. But I don't want to check the memory location. I am interested into the value of the object, whether both are the same or not. Then you must have to go there. Where exactly will do these types of things in the program? Let's say, in banking perspective, once again, think about that. Uh -huh. Let's say one customer is having the account in certain branch. Uh -huh. Yes or no? Yeah. And he's trying to open in the same bank with a different branch, once again, one account. Yes or no? Okay. So, of course, how they will come to know this is duplicate or not? From a code perspective, what they will do, that bank is already having one object of that customer and one more object is coming from the customer at the time of account opening. They will compare their all value one by one from the existing object with the help of equals method and they will come to know God, this is the existing customer. Yes sir, no. Oh, okay. So there is a loss of scenario by which equals method is coming in picture. You have a two object, let's say two customer object. You are confused whether both are different or the same. So what you will do? If it is a bank object, then definitely you know each object is having the account number. Yes. Someone has given you the two objects, B1 and B2, but make sure that this is the same class object. And you are really confused whether it is the same customer or whether it is a different customer. Mm -hmm. So what you will do? The unique is always account number. Yes, yes or no? Yes. You will take the first customer account number and second object account number and you will compare like this way and you will come to know whether this is a duplicate object or a same. Yes or no? 
right. there without equals method you can't do that so equals method is coming in that picture also you forget about the name you need to compare the all value but main things whatever the primary key is there try to compare that with the result whether it's existing customer or a new customer, new customer. here if i have a j also we can compare the j also let's see how we can compare more than one also give a j here mm -hmm. j value i'm going to give 70 so i compare this one now what i will write and this dot j equal to equal to b1 dot j now comparison will be based upon what i and j both yes or no this is a logical and yes sir. oh check it out again you will get true so like this way equals method whatever attribute you have you want to compare all attribute you can do like this way logical and logical and logical and mm -hmm. okay oh. yes sir. No. Right. So you can't compare, let's say if you are comparing only the name, it might be the case two customers having the same name and both are the different customer. No. So you can't only compare the name. What you need to do here, compare the another surname also, mobile, mobile number also, email address also. If all are coming same same, then definitely you can say this is the existing customer. So it depends on you, but if both objects are existing of your bank, then no need to compare the name and also directly you can compare the account number. Account number itself will give you the clear idea whether it's a duplicate or not. But if it's the case of new customer, you have to compare their all attributes, including the because you don't have the new customer is not holding the account number. After opening the account, only you have to give the account number. So in that case, you have to compare their name, age, mobile number, address, everything. Yes or no? No, I uh, just you have given the example of this account number I didn't understand that so, a customer has an account number and what is he, what is he asking is he trying to open one more account see there are two scenario one scenario is in the bank itself okay you got a two object of the same customer mm. which is your existing bank so in that case how we compare this upon account number because that is existing in your bank right Right. So that customer is holding the account number. Now another scenario is there. One object you are holding and one new customer is coming to open the account. So whoever is coming to open the account, that customer is having only their personal details. Right, right. They right. okay. are not having account number. So in that case, how can you compare according to account number? You have to compare the another attributes right. like this way. I, J, I will be replaced by name, J will be replaced by email address like this way. Yes, yes or no? Yeah. Clear? Yeah. Yes. So this is the two methods which will come in picture many times. You need to be very strong on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So equals method is also done. Right. Come to hash code. Currently I will not give you much about the hash code method because I need to discuss a lot about hash code. You simply understood whenever we are creating an object, then it is going to hash code method is going to convert that object value in certain hash number. Hash number is nothing but just like encryption and decryption, you know, encoding and decoding themselves. To converting the certain piece of characters by a certain piece of character. So whatever object you have created to avoid the hacking kinds of things, we are making a hash number of this object. So what has code method will do? It will generate one unique integer number for this object and that integer number you will get here. So people used to say this is giving the memory address in the format of integer, but actually it's not. It is converting the object value into hash number and it is coming in picture whenever you are talking about the password and all. This is also known as hashing techniques. This will be more clear once I will cover the collection framework for you. That time I will tell you what exactly has code method is doing and how it is coming in picture in the real scenario. Currently, you have to simply understand, if I call the hash code method by any object, it will generate some unique hash number mm. that is having the unique number of this. This would be uh, always same or it generates a trend, I mean, new number of the time? I told you unique, unique in the sense, always different. Always different, okay. Mm -hmm. It is not the same. There is certain algorithm for this. Okay. okay. Take care. So that algorithm is working according to. Okay. Yeah. 
चलो सो दिस थ्री मेथड इज क्लियर नाउ दिस फेक नोटिफाई नोटिफाई ऑल मेथड विल कम इन पिक्चर वंस आई विल कवर द मल्टी थ्रेडिंग फॉर यू Currently, we don't require to know this because for this purpose, we need to know the multi-trading. Mm -hmm. So, these three methods are covered during the multi-trading. The another intentionally, I am going to cover this finalized method. This is an important one. Clone method also, I will cover later. Now, finalized method, and we can say the concept name is auto memory management of Java. It's very important point from interview also and for your understanding point of view also. What is auto memory management and how Java is doing this? If you talk about the C C plus I mean C plus plus, then we don't have the auto memory management. In the sense, whenever your constructor is allocating certain memory space, you yourself itself have to deallocate the memory. Your compiler is not intelligent to remove that unnecessary memory allocation. Right. So there we have the concept of destructor. You have heard about or not? I don't know if you are aware with the C plus plus. There is a constructor and destructor concept. So constructor is allocating the memory space and this destructor is deallocating the memory space. Since in Java we don't have destructor concept because we know very well we are having the auto memory management. What exactly auto memory management is doing actually? Need to know. If you talk about the initial days. We were having the very less memory, and we are really bothering about the memory uses. But anyhow, we have now PB, DB, terabyte, petabyte, lots of memory. But still, we have a limited memory. Right. So what was happening during production? If your uh, your uh, project is start deployed, then we have a fixed size of RAM, and that was creating a problem. Our performance was very slow. It was not giving too much performance. Execution becomes very delayed. Because of course, unnecessarily objects are going to be created and they are going to occupy them. So we were looking some a smart JPM or virtual machine which can easily scan the whole memory and they can come to know what types of object is required for future or not. If it is not required, then let it be removed from the memory, or if it is required, then let it be consumed. Like a login object. If you are logging in any website. Then that login object is required first time to authenticate. I don't want to uh, maintain that security login code, which is uh, mainly for login purpose. Once login is done, then I don't want the security related code and that object inside my memory because it is unnecessarily uh, wasting the memory code. That was their use was only initially one time only while logging. So I want uh, someone can come and that they can remove that. Uh, kinds of object from the memory. Are you getting my point or not, Mr. Pawan? Yes. I'm giving you some story kinds of things so that will make you to understand the auto memory concept. Yes, yes. So in C C plus plus, we was not having that features, and that's the reason our uh, performance was very low. Mm -hmm. Java can be this features. Java is saying to you, don't bother about the location of memory. I will be responsible to remove your unnecessary object, which is no more required. Required and those types of objects is basically say in the technical world called abnormal. I'm sorry, uh, what I'm saying null object actually, but we used to say uh, the name for that. Uh, it's there one technical word is there. I will it will coming in my mind. I will repeat you. Mm -hmm. So what types of null object is there? Null object is the same that is no more required for your future reference. You can remove those types of object. But to remove those object, you should be a very smart as a user. Which object is required to remove? Answer is very difficult for the user. Right. So in Java, we are getting same features without any interruption. We don't bother about deallocating the memory. Our JVM is smart enough to remove those objects which is no more required for the upcoming execution. Now we will see how these all things are happening internally. That is interesting, and that will make you more confident once again. And you can explain to any person if someone is asking you how auto memory management of Java is working. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shallow.
as usual there is a e class and this e class is having the one attribute of i so if you want to print the i then what will be you have to write get it e one more that makes sense you have to write e one dot i and you will get the output as it is very clear yeah. no doubt yeah so what happen actually again you have created a object so we know very well whenever we will create a object that on that time what is happening actually some memory allocation is happening in the memory like this e1 and i is going to have a value called 10 correct yeah Now see what I am going to do. I make this e1 equal to null. This is the only way by which you can make your object as a abandoned. I was talking about this word abandoned in the sense null, object, which is no more required for the future. If you make any object as a null, the meaning is very clear. You are saying to the JVM that this object should not be used. anyhow inside my program mm -hmm. and no this object is now out of my class range this object should not have any authority to access the any resources of my class mm -hmm. but these all things happen in what happen actually in the memory once you make any object as a null try to understand that this structure is still there only the link between the object and reference is going to be broken Once you make any object as a null, then reference is also there, allocation is also there, but the link between both are going to be broken, and these all things happen in the memory. So compiler is not knowing what happened in the memory. It is still thinking syntactically it is correct. User is accessing the i value by the same class reference. Oh. So syntactically it is correct. but i told you always we have a two environment compile time environment and run time environment compile time environment is checking syntactically your program is correct or not and run time environment is checking logically your program is correct or not yes or no yes so in this case syntactically it is correct that's the reason our compilation is success right but once you run this program then again jvm will come in pitch and it will check oh god user is trying to call the member of this class by the null object and i know null object cannot be used for future so do you know what is the meaning of this in real time one customer has closed their account from a certain bank mm -hmm. then they will be out of the uses of atm credit card and their account also yes sir yeah the real time null in the sense when any customer is going to close their account you are making that customer as a null so meaning is very clear they will not allow to use the atm card now for that same funds right or same account they can't use the credit card also for the same account mm -hmm. if you still they are using the meaning is very clear that is not possible so not allow to use them right right similarly you can also jbm is saying this object becomes null so this object can't touch the any member of this class it is out of the class range and still you are trying to call that then you will get once again a very popular exception of java that is called null pointer exception yeah. check it out the program will not run successfully because your jvm is saying logically it is incorrect and i will not run your program your program is terminated mm -hmm. and this exception will come many times so whenever you are getting this null pointer exception make sure that you have some null object and by that null object you are trying to call any member of that class understood or not what is the meaning of null object yes no. yes again if you want to reuse this then again you have to write like this way even equal to new mm -hmm. e you can reinitialize this then it is okay you can again get the value but till now it is a null the link itself is broken from the memory you can't use that object this part is clear mr pavan yes great no so, okay just yes. one question so when you do this <coughs> even equal to null so as you said the link would be broken but memory would be still there right so 
Yes. This is not uh, the right way to do it. So it, it should be done by the JVM only, right? You should not do it like this because they are not releasing the memory or it could be released later. Have patience, have patience. I'm yes. coming step by step. Oh. Our target is to discuss on that only. Yes. But before that, I believe this was important to know what exactly null object meaning and what is happening in the memory. So just have patience. I told you, oh. always have the patience. <laughs> Tika? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I can understand your eagerness. Yeah. What is the meaning oh, of this? All right. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it should come slowly, otherwise it should start overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. And uh, one more point I would like to tell you is that since you are looking for a Hadoop part, mm -hmm. so at the step I am teaching you that is anyhow no more required for Hadoop, you need to know certain more topic. Yes. But I believe after covering this course Java, if you are plan to move in a complete development group, complete Java software development, then there you require the advanced sub also. And there it will help with these all concepts very well. Right, right, right. So, so if you are planning to know some advanced server stuff also, you can join, you can go ahead and I believe if you know the advanced server, it will be very easy for you to manipulate the Java project. Anyway, that is your decision. Yeah. Think then you can go. Now, our main concern is that one day is still null object is there, but my location is there, memory is there. I don't want to do that. If you want to see, then I can show you how to check the free memory in the RAM or execution. So we have one class with the name of runtime. Inside that there is a method called get runtime and inside that there is a method called free memory. If you want to know your free memory, then you can use the this stuff runtime dot get runtime dot free memory. So what I am trying to check here, before I mean before null object also I am checking the memory, free memory and after null object also I am checking the free memory mm -hmm. and try to see, you will see there is the same memory, there is no change in the memory space. So meaning is very clear to see my allocation is done. That is only to confirm you whether the memory is reduced or not. But you can see after making null also, your memory is still same, this much is the free memory, so meaning is very clear. Well, even is still occupied that memory space. Memory, yes. There is no impact after making the null object. But our intention is to remove this allocation which is occupied by the null object. Yes or no? Right. Exactly. And for that purpose, anyhow, your JVM is coming in picture for a certain cycle. There is a cycle, you can't predict that when this null object will be removed, but this is guaranteed this null object will be removed. Mm -hmm. Internally, there is a thread concept. That thread is running internally every time. That process is keep on going on in your CPU. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in your application. But it depends on your CPU when this is giving the time to those thread to remove this null object. But if you are very eager to remove this null object, you can explicitly make a request to JPM. So whoever is removing your null object that thread name is a garbage collector. What's the name of that thread? Garbage collector. Garbage collector. So garbage collector is coming once in a uh, millisecond or whenever it's getting a time. Mm -hmm. Definitely it will remove the null object. But if you want to see now how it's working internally, then you can pass a request to the garbage collector. How we can pass the request to a garbage collector? So inside the system class, you have one method with the name of GC method. Oh. GC stands for garbage collector. I have made a request to garbage collector and I told him to please remove this null object. I don't want this null object into my memory. So please try to come as soon as possible and please remove this null object from the memory. Let's run this program. If I run this program, then definitely it might be a chance your memory space will be reduced after this garbage collector call or it will take some more time because I told you they are making a request yeah. there is a two things request and command mm -hmm. request in the sense I can do or I cannot 
command in the sense you have to do so whenever you are calling any test method then you are commanding the test method and the test method have to execute okay. but here don't think like that you are calling a garbage collector you are making a request to the garbage collector okay. so when i learned this concept my sir has told me if whenever you are saying something to your wife mm. that is request <laughs> and whenever your wife is saying something to you that is command command so you are a man and person you can analyze this whether it's right or not but <laughs> since i'm unmarried so i don't know whether it's right or not no that right your cover line anyway right so if i run this program since it's a very small program it might be the case our memory space will be increased let's run this program and check it out here is a 15 and here is a 16 yes and no yes so what garbage collector has did they have did their job they have removed your null object from the memory that's the reason your memory space is increased mm -hmm. okay okay yes and no yes now that's not the end I was really eager to know how internally garbage collector is working. Yes or no? Yeah. So I was interested how internally garbage collector is working. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do an operation in that. When you are making a request to garbage collector, it is coming in your memory and it is scanning the whole memory. And whenever it found the null object. it is giving the list of null object to one of the method of your object class and that method is nothing but finalize finalize actually garbage collector itself is not going to remove your null object by the name it is clear garbage collector it is a collector not a remover yes or no yeah garbage collector is internally calling a finalize method internally garbage collector is calling the finalize method to remove the all none object while after scanning while garbage collector is scanning the whole memory finding the list of null object and then it is sending back to the finalize method and the null object is going to be removed by that finalize method just a moment yeah sure it's okay so uh yeah So I was interested to know that whether that finalize method is called or not. So what to do since it is a Java वाले का code, so we can't modify their code. So what I did when my son has told me that garbage collector is internally calling the finalize method, then I was eager to know where the finalize method is, how it is going to be called. So I was knowing that we can't modify the Java वाले का code. So what I did in my class itself, I have overridden the finalize method. Make sure that your finalize method whatever you have written here that will not remove the null object because you don't know the way the code simply this overriding i'm doing to make you understand whether this finalize is going to call or not so internally check it out i'm still calling the super dot finalize method yes or no okay. because the code written for removing it when in the object class that we can't copy and that we can't write actually okay. so my intention is to make you understand with the finalize method is called or not mm -hmm. yes or no yeah one more point i would like to share here is i have given one main mm -hmm. hello theek hai abhi main class le raha hu baad mein baat karta hu theek hai ha So I have kept one SOP in the main method also, and one SOP in the finalized method also. Yep. So since we have a null object and we are making a request to garbage collector, and I told you garbage collector is internally calling the finalized method, and this time this finalized method belongs to my class, so definitely it have to call my finalized method. And from my finalized method, it's supposed to go to the object class. Let's run this program and check it out. We are not calling any how finalized method anywhere. Can you see in the main method? I'm not calling the finalized method. But still, you are getting the finalized method as output. Then you can easily understand. Definitely, the other selector is calling this. Can you see here? You are getting finalized or not? Yeah. So meaning is very clear. The other selector is internally calling our finalized method. But if you see this output properly, then again you will get a big confusion, and that's what I got. Why it is off? I am making a request to the other selector in line number ten. Yeah. So before main. 
definitely the final line should be come. Yes or no? Yes. That's what I told you. It is always a request. Right. Now you can easily understand what is the meaning of request and command. Definitely you make a request in line number 10, but your garbage collector might be busy to doing something. So they told you, okay, fine, I got your request. You can proceed further. I will come whenever you get a time and I will remove your null object. Right. And that is the reason you are getting finalized now. This is not even fixed output. It might be that certain there is certain time there is a scenario, your finalized method will come first if they are not having certain object. Let's run this program once again. Can you see this output? Oh, okay. Mr. Bogdan, that's what I told you. See, the person who is having the proper knowledge, they can explain it properly and will make feel the Java. Uh, I have really worked hard on this whole concept and I have a strong confidence. And that's the reason I'm in this profession. Now I can make up. If I myself is struggling on these steps, then I'm never going to make my student or my attendee to understand all of this concept perfectly. So I told you, it's a request. It might be a chance. Sometimes finalized method will call first because garbage collector is free. They did a job very soon. But every time the output might be changed. Sometimes finalized, sometimes finalized, sometimes made, and like this way. Understood or not? Right, right, right. What will be if you don't have a null object and you make a request to the garbage collector? You are making garbage collector request, but in your class there is no null object. So what will be garbage collector will come to memory and it will scan the whole memory and it will form there is no null object. In that case, garbage collector will laugh on you. He will tell you, boss, you don't have null object. And if there is a null, no null object, then no way it will call the finalized method. Mm -hmm. If null object is there, then only it is calling the finalized method. If you run this program, you will get only main as a output, not as a Finalize. Clear. Yeah. So this question might be asked by the different different way. What is auto memory management of Java? Mm -hmm. How garbage collector is working? What is finalized method? So all are related to this concept only. You should make yourself very confident on this. Yeah. So. Okay. So these kind of things, I mean, uh, uh, how do you remember, as you said, I mean, you have worked hard, of course, I mean, you would have worked, but uh, these kind of things you won't be using in your project, right? Or, or it's just that over the period of time you keep re revising it and you understand or, but these things you won't be using in your project on the day to day basis, right? That's cool, that's cool. But if you don't know these things perfectly, Hmm. Then you can't write a better code on this. Okay. No, that's what I'm asking. So how do we memorize all these things? Because maybe after uh, you know ten days, I will forget half of these things. So what is the best way to memorize all this so that we don't forget? Or see, it's always a practice. I can't give you more than this. Mm -hmm. So I used to take the classes all this, so that is it is my mind. Yes. But of course, from the development side, this is not so much important. But uh, I'm not only bothering, only we are using in that project that concept. I want to make you to understand all these stuff. Mm, very I'm important, I think. Very important. Otherwise, you'll be always that's having important. assumptions. And that's what, see, uh, uh, Niket, I mean, that is what the thing was. I was aware of most of the things, but these things were never used to make sense. That, you know, even though you say garbage collection, but okay, what, what exactly happens and how it happens, you'll get only a few lines in books. But this, what you say is like the, with the experience, right? So that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we should yeah. keep revising or maybe, you know, keep uh, reading uh, about ah, it. Once you will be in the development field, then this part will be coming on picture and, you know, mind many times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one decade. I can't give you the lots of things. See, whenever you are writing a certain piece of code and certain logic or certain algorithm, mm -hmm. that time you have to always think, we, we, certain key points are there that I will tell you in the one class separately for this. Okay. So, date unnecessary object, don't date unnecessary uh, variable declaration. So, these all things are important. Certain things, certain guidelines are there, and there's a lot of tutorial over the internet also mm -hmm. to uh, know how to 
optimize the code and how to do that. The second point is coming, and in that, there's we must one point uh, how garbage is collected. You have to take care of your mind always. Okay. So, no, so we are done with this object class important methods. We'll discuss many methods one by one uh, when I will require. For that purpose, I require some more concept and then after I'm discussing it. Quickly, I have one more small topic we have that is final keyword. <coughs> so, we have one keyword with the name of final, which is having three scope. You can use the variable on <coughs> final, on variable also, on method also, and the class also. Okay? Mm -hmm. So these are the three scopes of a final keyword. We'll see one by one what happened if we are going to write a final keyword and what will be. Now, can you see here if it is a global variable, then you know very well it is taking the default value. Yes or no? And what will be the default value for this one? Zero. Zero. So if I run this program, you will get a zero value. Even if you are trying to modify this value, that is also possible. You can modify this. Yeah. Now, what will be the output? 23. Yes or no? Yeah. Now what I am going to do, I am simply making this variable as a final. Once you make this variable as a final, then you will get a compile time error and the rule is saying the final variable should must be initialized at the time of declaration. Now compiler is not going to give the default value to this one, so definitely you have to initialize this. So whenever any variable is a final, make sure that you must have to initialize at the time of declaration. Mm -hmm. And another rule is saying you can't modify the value of final variable. Final variable. Yeah. And that is the reason, that is the reason compiler is not going to give a default value to them. So once you are making any final variable, then definitely you have some initial value to give them. And if it is if compiler is going to give a default value to them then definitely what will be, even you can't give the new value to them. That's the reason compiler is saying, I'm not going to give the default value to the final variable. Mm -hmm. You yourself have to give the final variable and that will be final by the name it is filled. You should not allow to change this. Right. Take care. Yeah. So this is the final keyword. And one more interesting point I will tell you. If any variable becomes final and static both, then it is known as constant. What we used to say? Constant. Oh. Final and static together is coming, then it becomes constant. Right, right. So, so this is small about the final variable. Now what will be if I have a class and I don't want that class to be accessed by another class. Let's say I have a class D mm -hmm. and I don't want that class to be accessed by another class. So far you have seen any class can extend another class. Mm -hmm. If you want to restrict your class should not be the, I mean, inherited, then make that class as a final. If you make any class as a final, let's say I have created the D class and I make it as a final and can you see here, E class is trying to access the D class is getting an error. So what is the meaning? Final class yeah. cannot be yeah. inherited. Yes or no? Yes. So this is the second usage of final keyword. Third usage is, let's say you have a method. Mm -hmm. You want your class to be inherited, but certain method cannot be override. Okay. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Come to the B class. I want B class to be over extended, but this test method cannot be override. Then once again, make the method also as a final. Now, whoever is trying to override this test method, can you see in the C class, C class is trying to override this method. It is getting error, so meaning it's very clear you can't override the final methods. What error it gives? Remove the final from there or we can't override that. Okay. Mm -hmm. This error is saying cannot override the final method from B. Override B. So, there's many very popular question asked by interviewer, what is the difference between final, finally and finalized? So, two we have covered, final and finalized. Okay. Finally, we will cover by covering the exception handling concept. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, 
So one more interesting point you should know about final table. In interface, in interface, can you see here? Yeah. I'm simply declaring one variable. I'm getting an error. If you go to this error, then it will tell you final variable is not initialized. But I didn't make it as a final. And what is the meaning? The By time. default, every variables of interface is public, static, and final. Whether you are writing or not, public, static, final, in one sort, you can say constant. So every attribute of interface is a constant, internally, public, static, final. That is the reason compiler was giving you error if you are not initializing this. So in the difference of a flat class and interface, you can include this point also. Okay, every attribute of interface is by default public static and final. Okay, so that's all for today, I think.